The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. It's hard from the depths of this third wave to imagine better days. But yesterday, the federal Liberal government's budget put the aspiration for $10 a day child care in capital letters as part of its bid to, quote, punch our way out of the COVID recession. Tonight, the economic significance of that pledge and what it will take to get it done. Then, will the so-called she session give way to a she covery? We'll hear from women frontline workers on what that would look like to them. It's Tuesday, April 20th, and that's all next on The Agenda. Calling it a jobs and growth hat trick, Federal Finance Minister Christia Freeland put a national child care plan front and center in her first ever budget. The price tag is in the billions and needs the provinces to sign on. Let's find out if it's feasible and if it's enough with, in the nation's capital, economist Armin Yalnesian, Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers and a member of the federal government's task force on women in the economy. In Osgoode, Ontario, just south of Ottawa, Alana Powell, Executive Coordinator of the Association of Early Childhood Educators Ontario. And in St. Catharines, Ontario, Kate Bazanson, Associate Professor of Sociology and Associate Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at Brock University. And we're delighted to have the three of you back on our program tonight. I want to just start by putting out this fact file here. So for those who aren't right on top of the numbers from yesterday's budget, you can be up to speed. So Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this up and I'll read this out loud for those listening on podcast as well. The plan in yesterday's federal budget, $30 billion over the next five years, it was the largest line item in this budget, child care. $8.2 billion a year budgeted thereafter, $2.5 billion for Indigenous early learning and child care, and the hope is that this will cut fees by 50% within 18 months, the goal being child care that will cost parents $10 a day per child by the year 2026 nationwide. Armin, get us started. Is this the child care announcement you were hoping for? Yes, sir. I was blown away by this announcement. Uh, it was everything we were looking for and more. And now all we are missing are the provincial dance partners, which will be possibly a big hiccup in the coming months. But there is, for the first time in the nation's capital, the political will to see child care as a necessary critical element of the social infrastructure that can help create a much more resilient and potentially larger economy. We'll pursue that angle of whether the provinces will sign on in just a moment. Alana, how about you? Is this the announcement you've been waiting for? Uh, absolutely. I can say confidently that early childhood educators across the province are feeling more hopeful than ever about the future of the sector. It's been a really long year. Uh, it's been a long number of decades that folks have been fighting for this. Uh, yesterday, I had the privilege of being on a call with generations of child care advocates, uh, new early childhood educators who are just entering the profession, and, and we were collectively overwhelmed uh, by this commitment. And we're really excited to work collaboratively with the federal government and in Ontario with our provincial government to make sure that this happens for our children and families. Kate Bazanson, are you going to make it unanimous or are we going to get you to quibble with something here? There will be no quibbling. All of what has been said, I will underline and support. I'd say this is, this is how you build a system. And this is a triple word score for our recovery. It's good for kids, it's good for parents, and it's good for our economy. I am delighted over the moon. It's, it's fantastic. Armin, we are certainly well aware of how this pandemic has affected women disproportionately uh, going back over the past 14 months or so. Do you think this is the kind of announcement that will enable women to get back into the labor force? It is the only policy amenable announcement that any government can make because there's going to be large parts of this that are uncontrollable by any government. How many businesses shut down permanently because of the pandemic is unknowable right now because the pandemic is not over. 
And we know that in last, last spring, particularly, we had the world's first ever she session, and it happened globally because the, co the companies that shut down were marginal, non-essential businesses in personal services, in retail, in hospitality, in all the things that are just not essential to every day, uh, but disproportionately higher low-paid workers who happen to disproportionately be women who are racialized and recent immigrants and migrant workers. So those jobs may not be coming back, but the thing that will maximize the potential for things to get back to normal is to make sure we don't have built-in policy choke points in the system so that women can accept work when it is offered to them and don't have to quit work uh, because there's no childcare and they can't keep going on indefinitely providing unpaid care at home and doing paid work. So. Uh, this is the only policy amenable tool available to any level of government to assure we are maximizing our economic potential for recovery. Elena, let's do some of the math here. On average, how much does it cost to put a single child into child care? It can depend really on where you are located in the province, but median fees in Ontario per day right now, median it is for an infant space $66, toddler $54, preschool $45, kindergarten school age $42. So when we're looking at what was promised in this budget, $10 a day is a, is a drastic and transformative reduction in, in the cost associated for families. So this will move Ontario forward Forward and Canada forward in a big way in terms of um, economic justice and gender uh, equity, really. And Kate, as you look at the landscape in Ontario right now, let's just focus on this province. Can you compare, please, the, the supply of child care available with the demand of parents who want it? So um, pandemic is, a, is an important and interesting time. We've seen that the childcare sector has in fact uh, been put into crisis in pandemic. We've seen um, childcare centers close over the last year. In, in Ontario alone, 138 centers have closed over the last year in pandemic. Childcare has never been more essential, but also has never been more fragile. So right now, there are actually centers in Ontario that no longer have waiting lists. And that's as a result of a number of variables. One of those variables is, as we're back, we're back in March 2020, if we think about it, in terms of where we are in Ontario in this health crisis. You know, we have schools closed. We have of uh, parents being called or pushed out of the labor market again as a result of the sectors in which they work. So we're not in a period yet of recovery or moving to, um, to the other side. So right now we see that there are actually fewer, uh, fewer enrollments in centers than there were pre-pandemic. And this is in part owing to the cost. Parents are making a calculation. If I have a, a school-age kid home, I'm not going to keep my other child in, in child care and pay, you know, in Toronto, for example, $1,800 dollars a month. But it's also owing to the kind of calculation that parents are doing um, around vectors of transmission and level of exposure of members of their households. So there is, outside of pandemic, a huge demand. We now are going to come out on the other side of this with reduced supply and a precarious, a more precarious sector. So this investment right now is essential to getting us to the other side, to just returning us to whole where we were before the pandemic. And where we were before the pandemic was not a lot of spots for the number of kids who needed them. Well, let me do a fast follow-up with you then, Kate. If we wanted to create enough spaces to fulfill all of the demand for spaces, what is that number? <laughs> Um, that's a that's a great question. And right now in Ontario, we have uh, sorry in Canada, we have spaces for 27 percent of kids um, who who need childcare. So looking at the looking at the landscape across the country, we can see that we have a big distance to go. Quebec, for example, has a much much higher rate of accessibility for childcare. So Ontario is um, is going to need to do a lot of work to build out the number of spaces that are going to be available. And this new funding in the, that's promised in the federal budget goes a good distance to putting operational uh, money on the table to build out those spaces and grow a system over time. Elana, I just want to get a sense of it, though. Are we talking about a need for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of spaces? What is it? 
certainly to start, we're looking at tens of thousands in Ontario. We know we're only meeting about a quarter of the need right now in the licensed childcare sector, and that we certainly have, you know, the desire and the interest from families to use the services were they affordable, accessible to them. So, you know, starting slow, we're, we're certainly looking at 10,000 spaces to begin with, but the expansion, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of what exactly we need and where exactly we need it because need is different across the province and across the country. Right. All right. Armin, one of the reasons we love having you on this show is that you can translate uh, budgetese or bureaucraties. You don't speak it, but you can translate it. You understand it. And I want to, here's the line. The budget says $27.2 billion will be used, quote, to bring the federal government to a 50-50 share of child care costs with provincial and territorial governments. Translate. What does that actually mean on the ground? Yeah. What it actually means is that the federal government has been MIA on child care for 50 years and that the provinces have done most of the um, heavy lifting on whatever patchwork of system we've got across the country. The federal government now recognizes that this is a macroeconomic issue. It's not just a feminist issue. This isn't just a family issue. And this is going to hold back a lot of provincial rebounding. So they are offering effectively free money. You know, uh, they're saying you don't have to raise the revenues in your province, which is good news because the provinces are more cash strapped than the federal government is. So they're offering new incremental funding that is large, that scales up, and comes with conditions, but is not conditional on cost sharing by provinces. And at the end of that five years, the hope is that they will be fully equal partners with the provinces in what the provinces are currently spending. Thereafter, after five years, we'll see whether it's a cost share program, but right now it's not even cost share. It's, it just comes with the strings saying, we will give you the money if you are improving affordability, accessibility, and um, quality. And this is the first, this is the second round of agreements with the federal and provincial government like this, because in 2017, the federal government also offered uh, money to improve affordability and accessibility. This is the first time we're talking about quality, which is so incredibly uh, important. And it's a whole lot more money and it's for a much longer term. And it's basically laying the table for the next round of negotiations with bilateral negotiations, province by province. Well, Alana, let me play designated killjoy for a second here because I'm gonna go back more than 50 years to a time when the feds and the provinces were talking about creating Medicare in the country. And they did, of course. And the understanding was that it would be a shared 50-50 splitting the costs program. Now, of course, it's not 50-50 anymore. The feds are contributing about 23%, and the provinces are picking up the vast lion's share. How do we know that a 50-50 program today won't 10, 20, 30 years down the road with a different federal government turn into something that looks more like Medicare and less what you plan to spend today? That's an excellent question. And I think what's important to talk about here is that this is a five-year plan. It's the beginning of building a system. So the 50-50 cost share as a goal is ambitious and it's important and it's what we need. What happens next is really going to be about further negotiations that you know really take into account where where are we going, how is the system building happening, what are the needs, and to really see you know what are the economic benefits that we're seeing come from the system, and what does that mean in terms of next steps. So I think it's hard right now to predict what this will look like in 10, 15, 20 years, but certainly what the federal government has proposed in, in terms of the first five years is exactly what we need right now. All right, fair enough. Let's follow up then. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Armin. This is really an important analogy. The Medicare analogy is extremely important for ELCC. And what you have focused on is the cash transfer. But when Medicare was created, it was created as both cash and tax point transfers because that's what Quebec wanted. And frankly, and it was after the war where the war had actually sucked up tax room from the provinces, taken it to the federal level, and the provinces said, give us back our tax room. So Medicare was predicated on a combination of tax points given back to the provinces and cash. So the cash part is actually what was the original envisioning. It was supposed to be 50-50 between tax points and cash. But the provinces, after 1995, 
everybody had this allergy to raising taxes. Everybody wanted to cut taxes. So everybody said the tax point space doesn't hold because nobody wants to raise taxes. So we are now operating in an entirely different fiscal federalism, which is all about cash and not about tax room. So we can't mix those metaphors 100% of the way. Gotcha. All right. In which case, uh, let me raise this with Kate then. We know, I mean, I guess some people might be asking themselves today, if the federal government wants to create a child care plan, why don't they just do it? Well, the answer, of course, is that our Constitution gives responsibility for these social services to the provinces. So they have to negotiate an agreement with the provinces. In which case, Kate, what do the provinces want as their part of these negotiations? Well, you know, it, I think that the provinces have been at the table at least since 2017 in negotiating the bilateral agreements, and they were rolled over for a year this past year because of the, the conditions in pandemic. So the principles uh, and agreements have already been uh, established, and this builds this builds on those. One of the things, of course, that Armin has said absolutely, absolutely correctly is that this is a massive investment. And when the federal government is saying it's coming to the table with lots of cash and it wants to be an equal partner, let's just look right, like right now in Ontario this past year, the federal government can. Uh, uh, contributed about $145 million towards early learning and child care, where the province con contributed $1.6 billion. The federal government has not been a significant financial player at the table. So now to be able to say, we are going to move to a position of being a 50% a partner at the table, this allows provinces to say, we can plan, we can, we can build our workforce, we can build a wage grid, we can... We can set fee caps. We can make it affordable for parents. We can make it high quality. And we can build out the operational spaces. And we have a partner who's willing to put really significant cash on the table year over year to do what we know is the best practice in building a system and providing all of those economic outcomes for the economy that we are going to need to get out of this very significant and difficult position that we're in. There's always a pandemic. There's always a federalism dance. I've been calling this pandemic federalism. We are at a different moment. We've seen, uh, you know, friction, but also the need for collaboration. And we need our economic engine to be ready to go and to fire. And to get it to fire, we need to do this investment now build this system so that we can have that kind of GDP return, those kinds of taxation revenues, the kinds of hugely important uh, developmental outcomes that are going to set up our kids for the best possible future and, of course, to be a really important future workforce to take care of all of us because we're, we're going to be the aging population that's going to need them and we have a smaller population coming up um, compared to the population that's aging. Elena, let me do a little deeper dive on this angle, though. If, I mean, usually when the federal government tries to become an equal player with the provinces in a particular social service, there are strings attached. So the feds often say, here's the money, but you got to do X, Y, and Z. What's the X, Y, and Z in this, in this case that the feds are going to insist on for the amount of money that they're putting in? Well, there's still uh, details to come, but what is really clear in the language of the budget is that there will be a priority on not-for-profit services. There is a priority on quality, and there is, we suspect, a priority on funding the services, because what they're really talking about here is building a system, not another tax credit, not another one-time payment to set up a program. This is about system building. It's about funding the services. So we can expect to see some uh, some restrictions and measures on how that money is spent. And really, that's important in our province. This is a lot of money. It's important to children and families, and we have to make sure we get it right. And so the federal government does have a leadership role to play here in, in setting those expectations. Um, but yeah, a lot is still to come in the details. Well, speaking of the details, all right, Armin, uh, I don't have to tell you, there are people in this country who simply don't believe in this. There are people in this country who say, uh, rather than using public money to create spaces, you should do what kind of the Stephen Harper approach was, which was simply to, to flow money to parents and let them make their own decisions about whether they want to spend that money on actual child care in a professional setting or using that money for their own purposes uh, as it relates to child care. 
uh, they are going to look at this $30 billion price tag and they're going to say, OMG. Uh, what do you want to say to those people today? Um, we've done it their way for 50 years. <laughs> uh, so the amount of money that flows to parents through the Canada Child Benefit, and don't forget in the fall economic statement, there was another $2.4 billion that was money in your pockets. More money in your pockets is always the conservative solution to everything, whether it's a tax cut or some kind of refundable tax credit or whatever it is. It's all about more money in your pocket. More money in your pocket does not build one more new regulated high quality. It does not train one more person. It does not enforce quality controls. And I want to go back to your question, actually, about what do the provinces um what what do the feds want from the provinces mm -hmm. and where what are we what are they likely to ask the provinces for and i want to point out that ontario as much as we talk about quebec being the leader of the pack uh in canada in terms of affordable and accessible um child care which it is there is no question about that um it took women's employment rate from below average to above average and it is now the world leader in labor force participation rates of women with children under the age of three. So we know how to get more moms working. But that isn't the only thing. We would be leaving money on the table if we are not improving the learning potential of children, um, making sure they're learning ready when they enter school and learning supported as they go through school. We, we literally know that that pays for itself in addition to mommies getting back to work. And in Ontario, we are the leaders in high quality care for four and five year olds who, not because of Premier Ford, but because of Premier, ex Premier Wynne, who introduced full day junior and senior kindergarten. In fact, Premier Legault campaigned on that when he was trying to become a leader. So every province has got a quality issue as well as an accessibility issue. Even Quebec has got childcare desert, deserts. Every province is going to come to that table for bilateral negotiations, looking for the things that are of priority for them to improve, just like they did in 2017, except now there's a quality part of this that has been explicitly labeled, which has got to do with the quality of the people providing mm. the care. And if you are underpaying people and deregulating their qualifications, you're going to get suboptimal care for our youngest learners. Why would you do that? So why would the federal government pour money into a subpar system? That's why I think all three of us are so excited is, yes, there's a lot of money on the table. And there are not so much conditions as deals that will be cobbled province by province within a framework that really lifts up the importance of the quality of the care that children are receiving. That's a huge breakthrough. Just a little piece here. I mean, for the record, I don't think there's a chance in H-E double hockey sticks that Dalton McGinty is watching us right now. But if he were, I think he'd be yelling at the TV set saying, it was me who did it. It wasn't Kathleen Wynne. It was me. So for the record. My apologies to the former premier, whoever it was. <laughs> it, it, was the, it was the 24th, not the 25th premier. Anyways, Kate, but the whole issue of Quebec, uh, uh, you know, has been raised again. And let me do a quick follow on that. Is the Quebec model which, as we've just heard from Armin, gets kudos all the time. Is it exportable to the rest of the country? Yeah, I think it really is. And I think, I mean, the thing about the Quebec model, and I think that we, it's something that we need to hold in the back of our minds, um, is that Quebec launched a comprehensive review and reform of its family policy, policy that included both parental leave and early childhood education and care. And they, but what they did in early childhood education and care was they did what is being proposed in the federal budget, which is funding the services, funding the workforce, and building operational capacity. Those are the three pillars that are, are absolutely needed and are scalable to have the kinds of outcomes that we've seen in Quebec. You know, Armin has alluded to the kind of uh, the kind of return on investment in the Quebec model. We know that for every dollar invested yields conservatively more than double in returns. And we saw that in Quebec over the over the period from about 1997 to 2016, the investments in early childhood 
education and care, and of course in other areas of family policy, yielded a 16 percentage point increase in women's labour market participation. Elsewhere in Canada, that was just 4% over the same period. So we see that that kind of comprehensive attention to design with those three principles attended to yields the kind of developmental, social and economic outcomes that are good for kids, good for parents and great for our economy. Let me do this with Alana because of course when you say childcare, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I guess we need to understand is the money in yesterday's budget announced by the federal government designed to go to not-for-profit li licensed child care operators only or do the independents and or for-profits get a piece of this action as well? It seems like the federal government is indicating a preference for not-for-profit not service delivery, although it's unclear what that really looks like. Again, there's details to come. In Ontario, right now, about 75% of child care services are delivered through not-for-profit models. So I think the federal government is going to be looking for the provinces to continue investments in those areas, and that's for a number of good reasons we know. Every dollar invested into a not-for-profit program goes directly back into the program. It supports higher staff wages, better working conditions, uh, supplies for the children. So it really enhances the quality that is so important in this federal budget and that we've never really seen governments take on quite so robustly. So I think that's an important question, and I think it's a question that we're going to have to work collaboratively with the federal government to see how we make this happen. Okay, let's do this fast here. Stat board two, please, Sheldon. Is this a career people still want to go into is the question. And uh, Alana's association did some surveying. 2,000 nearly replied. 43% say they're considering leaving the early years sector. 13% are actively seeking opportunities outside the sector. 89% report an increase in job-related stress. 54% report decreased job satisfaction over the past year. Naturally, a common concern being that increased sanitization responsibilities are taking away from time normally spent with kids. I guess, Alana, my question is, how, how difficult is it going to be to build the kind of system you want when so many people are apparently either unhappy in it or may actually want to get out of it? I don't think it's going to be that difficult. We know the solutions to address the recruitment and retention issues in our sector. They existed before the pandemic, and certainly they've been exacerbated by it, as you just saw in those figures. We're hearing from early childhood educators that they're stressed, they're exhausted, they're frustrated, they feel left behind by this province, and they're ready for change. But what's remarkable about our sector is their commitment and their dedication to the work that they do. What they need is decent work. They need professional pay and compensation. They need access to a wage grid, a publicly funded wage grid. We know the policy solutions and the funding solutions to get there. It's just a matter of the political will. And I have to say, this is the first time we've seen the federal government recognize that valuing early childhood educators as the heart of the system, this, this is monumental language for our sector. This is going to change lives. So I think the federal government has got it right. We know that this will take investment into the workforce, but that is a key component of funding the services. Mm -hmm. You cannot separate them. Kate, I'm literally down to 20 seconds here, but I am kind of curious. Um, do you think it took a working mom as a female finance minister to get this through ultimately? <laughs> You know, I think it, I, yes, I do in some ways. I think it, it's important for us to recognize that this is our first gender equal cabinet in Canadian history. Um, I think that having a woman finance minister deliver this is historic and important. And I think that it shows that um, we may have been thinking the wrong way about getting child care forward because we needed to have more women at the table to make it happen. And I'm very grateful that we've arrived at this point. Gotcha. Well, as I thank the three of you for coming on to our program tonight, the one question I didn't get to ask, but I really want to, is, Armin, how many LP records do you have behind you at the moment? That is amazing. <laughs> uh, I'm lucky enough to live with an audio uh, fan, and uh, we do a lot of dancing in the kitchen, so <laughs> I don't know how many thousands of records we've got, but... <laughs> that is wonderful. Awesome that is wonderful, and I'll bet you'll be dancing tonight. Okay. Armin Yalnizi and Alana Powell, Kate Bazanson, it's so good of all of you to join us on TVO tonight. Many thanks.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right from the very early days of this pandemic, economists began talking about a she-session. Jobs often done by women were high on the list of those lost to lockdowns, just as many others deemed essential were those done by women. With us now to find out about their lives a year and counting into this pandemic, let's welcome, in Shelburne, Ontario, that's in Dufferin County, Kalisha Hoyes, a grocery Hi. store manager in Mississauga. In Durham region, Birgit Umagba, an intensive care unit nurse who also teaches nursing at Centennial College. And in the east end of the provincial capital, Amanda Monday, owner-operator of The Workaround, a professional workspace with childcare on the premises. And also in the city's east end, there's journalist Lorraine McKeon, whose latest book is Women of the Pandemic, Stories from the Front Lines of COVID-19. And we are delighted to welcome all of you onto TVO tonight for a really important and timely discussion. And I want to kick it off just by reading an excerpt from Loren's book to get us into our conversation. So Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this graphic up and away we go. The story of the pandemic was the story of women. In Canada, women comprise 81% of healthcare workers. Notably, they make up the vast majority of nurses, social workers, and personal support workers, PSWs. Beyond the healthcare front line, the New York Times estimated that one in three jobs held by women had been designated as essential during nationwide shutdowns, and that racialized women specifically held more essential jobs than anybody else. Throughout the pandemic, these women were tasked with keeping our bodies and minds healthy, with keeping us fed, with keeping our hospitals and public spaces clean, with helping the most vulnerable among us, and with being near our bedsides when we died. Loren, tell me, this was your third book. What was your mission in writing this book? Well, I think that, you know, women's stories so often get overlooked, we get left behind. And I didn't want that to happen with the pandemic, especially uh, because we have, women have lost the most, but we've also led um, us through these extraordinary times. And I think we need to um, remember these stories for years to come and we need to highlight them. What kind of folks did you interview for the book? So many women. I spoke to uh, over 50 women uh, from long haul truckers who are, you know, bringing supplies across the country to women on the front lines of the medical profession, to essential workers, to mothers, to people who are trying to keep their business, uh, to scientists who are developing vaccines. You know, we um, were everywhere. <laughs> and and I think, you know, we have so many stories to tell. Well, we have some of those stories that we're going to tell this evening, starting, Birgit, with you. Uh, when the pandemic first hit, how did it change your life? Oh, a lot. So as an um, immigrant and a social support parent, um, we I actually lacked the social support network to be able to work full time and to look after my nine year old daughter. Um, definitely. And this is the story of so many of us, not just me. I have colleagues that have, you know, toddlers, school age children at home. Some of them are so support parents. Some of them have spouses that are working. Um, I actually have a colleague that had to quit her job as a nurse um, right now um, because she had no support to keep working. Um, and definitely, we are bearing the brunt of this crisis, and it's yeah, having a toll on a lot of us. Hmm. How much are you able to work these days? These days, um, I'm able to work two or three shifts a week, um, so it's really challenging. Um, a lot of us um, are trying to get our voices out there and um, seek support. Some of us are uh, mothers that are waiting for our spouses to be reunited with us. There are thousands of us out there. A lot of us are frontline workers who are waiting for the Minister of Immigration to prioritize family sponsorship so at least we can have the support we need to work. The waiting for your spouse, that's your situation, right? Your husband's in Nigeria? That's correct. That's correct. What are the prospects of getting him over here? Oh, well, uh, right now it's more of a waiting game. We've, we've been told that COVID has put a stop on so many of the applications, but we know that international students are being prioritized right now because um, that's the situation. Um, a lot of us are Canadians waiting for our spouses, and we're not really getting updates, unfortunately. Okay, thanks for that. Kalisha, how has the pandemic affected your family? Oh, it's um, affected us greatly. I have two young boys, so with them having to be homeschooled, it just changed the whole dynamic of 
what I'm used to sending them to school. I had to rely on um, my in-laws and they're a bit older. So I also just, it was, it was very hard on me because being a frontline worker and seeing so many people every day, it just made me very nervous that the things I can possibly bring back to my family. Right. So it, it was very hard. You're a grocery store manager. Yes, I am. So you are considered, you're considered an A1 frontline, real important essential mm -hmm. worker at a time like this. How's that feel? I am. It, it feels good. It feels good. But it's one of those things that kind of makes us feel like, you know, I've been doing this job for almost 15 years now. So, you know, to be acknowledged as a frontline worker now is great. But, you know, we've always been doing the same job and we've always been the backbone to this community. Funny how we kind of know that now in a way we didn't know that before, eh? 100%. 100%. Okay, Amanda, let's bring you in. How's this all been for you? Yeah, it's a one, two, three, twenty punch. You know, I I'm a mother of two kids. My kids are six and four, and I own a small business. Ironically, that helps working parents access flexible childcare when they can't work from home. Uh, I've been closed since you know we were shut down in the first wave of the pandemic in March 2020. We reopened in July. I'm in East Toronto. We were then ordered closed by the Toronto Public Health in November as part of a gray lockdown, and we haven't been allowed to reopen since. So I haven't been allowed to make a dollar of revenue in months and months. I, you know, I had nine staff. I laid everybody but two teachers off. I've been trying to figure out the wage subsidy versus the emergency benefits for myself. Uh, oh, and my two kids are currently around the corner online learning at home. Uh, oh, so you're not at home right now? I am at home. Like, by around the corner, I literally mean over my shoulder. <laughs> I see. Okay. Okay. Well, if they want to make a cameo at some point, that's okay. Yeah, just we've had lots of uh, kids, pets, parents, every, anyway, lots of different kinds of cameos on this program over the last year. Tell me, how, how easy or difficult has it been for you to navigate all of the supports that the various levels of government have put in place during the course of the pandemic? Uh, I have put out a public petition that small business owners should be awarded MBAs for the level of <laughs> navigation on financial modeling predictions. I don't want anyone to say the word pivot to me one more time. <laughs> uh, you know, it's there's so many complicated factors in terms of I have to keep the business alive. I run a brick and mortar space, which means my my fixed costs are consistent regardless of whether or not I'm open. Rent is still rent, hydro is still hydro. Uh, figuring out how I'm gonna pay the top ups from a wage subsidy that's 75%, I still owe the 25. The rent subsidy, we're getting 90% now in lockdown, but that means there's a 10% delta. Uh, you know, trying to figure out how to do the right thing, when to apply, you know, I would say, the two things I focus on in addition to parenting full time is applying for subsidies, paying the bills with the subsidies, and then figuring out how do I expand the business to survive this and, and what does recovery look like? Hmm. We'll get to that later. Uh, Loren, you've now heard three other stories in addition to the 50 plus you had in your book. How typical are the ones we're just hearing tonight? You know, I think it is important to remember that women have had such a diverse range of experiences. Um, that said, the struggles that, you know, we just heard about and the challenges, those are extraordinary, extraordinarily common. Um, I don't think, you know, no one has had an easy time during the pandemic, but mothers especially have faced just, you know, 10 times more challenges, 20 times more challenges than um, others. And even in a home where there are two presumably equal co-parents, uh, you still find it's the mothers who bear a disproportionate part of the responsibility. You are hearing that. Yeah, I mean, that hasn't changed over the pandemic. And in fact, I think, you know, the pandemic has only exacerbated it. A study just came out of Canadian working parents, and we know that 12 times as many mothers as fathers have had to leave their jobs to care for their school-aged children. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that says right there that even in the homes that have the most maybe equal intents or intents to be equal, it, it just, it's not what, it's not what's happened. You know, we're trying to roll back um, something that has existed for a really long time. Yep. 
Birgit, let me get you back in here, and I really want to tap into your knowledge of the front lines in healthcare because of your work as a nurse. We hear the science table, the briefings from the premier, the briefings from uh, the healthcare experts. We hear that ICUs are at the bursting point right now. What's your personal experience on that front? Um, that's correct. So I, I think the media doesn't even do justice to uh, what we are experiencing. Uh, we know that a lot of nurses, majority are women, um, and majority are juggling, um, you know, homeschooling. And I don't know how we are actually doing it, and are also going to work in ICU. Um, so nurses are, we're all stressed. Um, it's so challenging to be in the ICU right now. Um, we are watching patients die alone. Um, trying to trying to facilitate video calls with families and loved ones as much as we can um, with all the technical difficulties as well. Um, um, I have colleagues that are quitting. I have colleagues that are breaking down and actually um, not knowing what to do. We've also heard of stories of, unfortunately, nurses who took their lives um, during this pandemic. Um, there's a heightened level of stress and trauma. And now we're talking about... Um, possible triage protocol where doctors, nurses, artists, um, you know, will have to witness a decision of who gets to live and who gets to die. Um, I don't I don't know how we're going to get through that. A lot of us are going to need therapists to really go through that. Well, Birgit, even in the midst of that very thorough and heartbreaking answer, you, you did not tell us one detail. You got COVID-19, yes? Yes, I have said this so many times. Unfortunately, last year, at first I had to isolate because I was exposed to a patient that eventually came back positive for COVID. Um, so, so that was okay. And then um, in October, I got COVID myself and I had to isolate. Um, and this was without pay because as we know, CERB or CRSB is not paid sick days, so totally different. So I, do not I, I did not qualify for um, serve and then CRSB we know is four hundred and fifty dollars and that doesn't do anything um, and that's not paid sick days absolutely not so the even the struggle of coming home to my daughter she was crying it was so traumatic for her she thought I was gonna die I had to tell her you know um, we will get through this and we just had to cope and manage who took care of your daughter while you were sick I did you did mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously, you, you made it through the COVID-19, which is great, but how badly did it sort of knock you on your back? I was, it took me a while to, um, uh, you know, gain my strength and my energy level just to be able to go back to work because I have to work. I have to put food on the table. Um, this is why we're saying that people will continue to go to work sick, unfortunately, because a lot of people are the, the breadwinners of your families. As long as we don't have paid sick days, it, 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 it's, it takes a lot for someone to really sit back at home when they know they will have no income and, and the entire family will suffer. Hmm. So, yeah, it was a struggle getting my feet back and actually going back to work, even when I... I recovered. Well, we're glad you did recover, obviously, and, and uh, I'm glad that things have worked out with you and your daughter. That's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Uh, Kalisha, let me get you back in here. Um, the changes that you've had to make in the workplace in order to adapt to the new realities of COVID-19, what's that been like? Oh, it's been pretty, um, pretty hard. It's just it's constantly overthinking everything that we're doing. If we're putting through a customer and then we're on to the next customer, okay, did I wipe off the debit machine? Did I wipe off the belt? So it's just constantly second guessing things, things I used to be able to do, like eat my lunch while I do something else at the same time I can't do anymore. Like my hands literally are cracking by the end of the day with the amount of sanitizer I have to use. So it's just, I think more so than anything, it's the overthinking it. Like you're constantly, like you touch your face and you're like, oh, did I sanitize my hand before I did that? So it's just, it's the overthinking I think that's getting to the most of us. How understanding have your customers been? Um, I think like most, like most are pretty understanding and pretty nice. Um, I definitely find a lot more customers being a lot more grateful for our service. You hear a definitely a lot more thank yous, even just simply walking by them in the store. They'll be like, thank you for coming in. Thank you for all that you're doing. So it has been very nice to see that the customers really are acknowledging the fact that we're coming and we're leaving our families every day to do this job. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And any employees at your place get COVID-19? Yeah, we have had a few cases in my store. And what happens? 
Um, they're off for a couple of weeks, then again, without paid sick days, unfortunately. And um, again, it's, as she said before, too, like it's a lot of people, it's hard for them to stay home. It's hard for me to stay home. I, I, my income is very important in my household. So it's hard for us to stay home. If you have a symptom and you're kind of wondering, maybe it's just a cold, maybe I don't think it's COVID. So like you see people come in with coughs and stuff sometimes and it's like, oh, no, it's allergies. So definitely the paid sick days is so important to us. Uh, have you had to say to anybody, you don't sound too healthy right now. I'm sending you home. Oh, definitely. You've <laughs> done that. A couple of times, yeah. Mm -hmm. And even just like for interviews, like trying to bring in some people because we, we don't have a lot of daytime staff. A lot of daytime staff is normally older women and older women don't want to work in a grocery store right now, which is understandable. So even just interviewing last week, there was someone I was speaking to and she had a cough and I'm like, you know, we'll speak in two weeks. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> like, you know, so. Amanda, let me get you back in here. How was business at the workaround before the pandemic kicked in? We opened in the fall of 2018 uh, and we closed in March 2020. So we were open only about 18 months. And I had served, you know, 846 families, 220 plus unique children. It was a profitable, flex, daytime childcare and co working business uh, when I was planning on opening new locations in 2020, actually. Hmm. What prospects do you think you have for getting the business open and when? You know, it's really hard in Ontario and in Toronto in particular right now. Uh, I'm an indoor shared space with shared washrooms, shared kitchen facilities, and at the same time, daycare, which is so critically important for working parents. And so I'm optimistic by the federal budget childcare funding that, that gives me some hope that the business has some really amazing growth opportunities in the future. In the short term, I think we're going to be closed for a little while still. And, you know, I, I echo Kalisha, like our, the number of bleaching we did and disinfecting and cleaning and spraying down door handles. I mean, I have 13,000 square feet and I laid all my staff off. It was me who was doing all of that. Um, you know, I just want to get back to doing that and serving as many families uh, as soon as we can. We hope you get that chance. Uh, Loren, that's a woman-owned business that we've just heard from there. How did the pandemic, broadly speaking, affect female-owned businesses overall? Well, they like I think we're seeing a trend here, and that is that women have suffered more, and that certainly has been the case for women-owned businesses. Um, they've faced higher challenges, um, you know, partly because of the sectors that women entrepreneurs are more likely to, you know, build a business in, which is hospitality. Uh, care, you know, things that uh, businesses that have borne the brunt of the closures. So I think, you know, it's across the board, we're seeing not only women employees, but certainly women entrepreneurs um, lose out. Loren, follow up with this, if you would, because I know it cannot have escaped the attention of any of the people on this program tonight that uh, Christian Freeland, the finance minister, announced yesterday a multi-year, multi-billion dollar a child care program with the idea being eventually to get to a $10 a day per child program. Um, imagine that program in place, Loren. What kind of a game changer is it? You know, I think it's a huge game changer. It has the potential to be a huge game changer. Um, affordable child care is something that women have been lobbying for for decades. You know, as I've said before, the pandemic hasn't created these problems, but it has exposed them and it's made them undeniable. And I think it's very undeniable now that we need affordable childcare. At the same time, women have to have jobs to return to. And we have to remember that as well. You know, childcare is only one piece of the puzzle to help women to get them back to work. Indeed. Birgit, how much of a uh, challenge has childcare been for you? Oh, a lot. I've had to use babysitters as opposed to, um, to uh, registering my uh, child, daughter in a child care center because uh, I couldn't afford it, right? So, um, and I've lost income a lot of times because I would, when my babysitter calls in sick, I, I have to stay home with my daughter. 
Um, so yeah, it, it's an ongoing issue for me and for many of us on the front line. Now, Women are really affected by this. Yeah. Right. I, I think you mentioned earlier you're down to two shifts a week now because of the whole situation you're in now. C can you make ends meet on two shifts a week? I can barely survive. I can barely just pay my bills, and that's about it. Hmm. So how are you doing it? I don't know. Two shifts a week, credit cards, right? It, it's a cycle. So you are taking on additional debt right now? Absolutely. And when the babysitters come in, different babysitters dealing with your children, I presume you find that a, a less valuable, less effective option than if they had quality, consistent daily child care. Of course, definitely. Yeah. We, the, the child wants consistency too. They need it. For sure. Amanda, with women often taking on um, uneven amounts of child care and housework, how did the pandemic, in your view, affect all of that? You know, we need to recognize that work has changed and without childcare, we cannot get women back to the workforce. Look at the women on this panel, uh, full-time Monday to Friday center-based care is not going to serve the Saturday night grocery store worker, the ICU nurses who need overnight care, the entrepreneurs who I serve who might have a freelance graphic design contract for a few months but can't possibly commit to a full year. Uh, I think what is what I'm hopeful about with the child care announcement is we recognize that we need to fund child care. The next step is to recognize that the types of child care that Canadians need is far more diverse than what's available right now. And that means we need to work with private daycare providers like myself, small business owners, we need to engage with a whole range of diverse stakeholders in order to offer more care instead of trying to fix a broken system. That's a that's a great controversial issue. You just opened up a can of worms on there, and that's okay, but that's another show. show. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. It has been in the past, and I'm sure it will be again. Uh, Kalisha, when you've got to be at work and the schools are closed, what's happening with your kids? Um, right now, I'm very grateful for my in-laws because they're retired, so I actually get a lot of help with them. But it's definitely difficult. It's definitely a matter of asking for help, especially when it comes to the weekends, because I definitely still have to work weekends. So it's 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 definitely just a matter of family and friends and whoever can help out that's close to me. I, I, right now, I'm not comfortable even sending my kids to daycares, just knowing how my, my children are. They're still young, and I wouldn't trust them to be safe enough, I guess, in sanitizing. So for me, it's just relying on close family. And if not, then again, it's me calling into work because my kids come first. Hmm. The kids are how old? I have a 10-year-old and one that's about to be two. 10 and about to be two. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, oh, boy, your in-laws are not going to like my asking this question, but tough luck. How old are they? Oh, they're, yeah, like one of them is in their early 70s and the other one's the late 60s. Okay, how do they, <laughs> how do they keep up with a 10-year-old and, and an almost two-year-old? It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like every day it's different complaints or different issues or the talking back from the older one or just too much energy from the younger one. So it's always like a juggling match and, you know, trying to balance their sanity and try and give them a couple of days off if I can. I, like I'll use my other grandmother and she's again early 70s too. So I'm just relying on all the older people in my family right now that are retired. <laughs> and uh, Amanda, let me just ask you a quick question about online learning. How's that working out for you? I, I would pull my kids today. Uh, I, I consider it every day. Listen, like my son is four. He's in junior kindergarten. He's expected to sit in front of a laptop and navigate tabs and switching between a video to a group chat to mute to unmute. I mean, the number of times he's just going to shut the screen and walked away and I'm on the middle of a, a call like this, there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, you know, it's, I find for working women in particular, like me, who's home alone with my children all day trying to keep my business alive, the expectations on us to sit beside our kids, guide them in their learning, support their emotional and social development, keep them fed. They constantly keep needing to be fed every day. I mean, yeah, they're like that, aren't they? Uh, it's, 
they keep wanting more meals. You know, it's, uh, it, I, I really, uh, can't wait to get back to some version of normal, uh, one that better supports women. Kalisha, how about you for the, uh, for the online learning and your kids? Oh gosh. <laughs> it's definitely been such a challenge in my household. It's hard for me to come in from work and I also commute. So I'm coming like an hour um, out of my way to go to work to and from. So by the time I come home in the evening to double check all the assignments that haven't been turned in and then you ask the question and, oh, we didn't have to turn it in. We just had to show it. So it's just, it's so hard to be on top of their schoolwork and going to work. And even when I had the time off and I was home with them at the beginning with this, it was still just such a challenge for me because we're almost like supply teachers without the pay. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Loren, let me ask you to wrap it up for us and put a bow on it. Um, we, we've heard this expression so many times, build back better. And as we consider how to rebuild our society better, that takes into account some of these realities we've been talking about tonight. Uh, what does that look like to you? You know, I've been writing and reporting on women's issues and women's challenges for my whole career. And I think, you know, it's this idea of returning to normal. Um, I don't like it because I would like us to envision um, a way to build better and to build a blueprint that puts women first and puts our most vulnerable first. And I think that the pandemic has only underscored how essential it is that we do that going forward if we want um, a society in which women succeed. And, you know, why wouldn't we? Well said. Loren McKeon, Amanda Monday, Kalisha Hoyes, Birgit Omagba, it is really good of you to spend some time with us tonight and just peel back the curtain a bit and give us a greater understanding of what's been going on in your lives for the last 14 months. Uh, Godspeed to all of you and good luck going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, April 20th, 2021. From Premier Ford's press conference last Friday onward, there have been some truly astonishing days in provincial politics. Tomorrow, we'll take a closer look at what's happening. Also, we'll tell the story of maybe the most important goal ever scored by a Toronto Maple Leaf and the incredible tale that unfolded after it. Hint, the tragically hip memorialized the moment. Hope you'll join us for that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you.